1983, in the midst of the second British invasion, a new wave band that had a really exotic name almost nobody could pronounce rocketed up the charts with a one-hit wonder for the ages. Led by a singer with one of the decade's most iconic hairstyles, and again with this unique band name, this group seemed poised to be a lot more than that. But then the band fired this charismatic singer, and they never had another hit. But he did. The former lead singer tells the story of this sing-along ditty and a bass line for the ages coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button below to be a part of this community dedicated to the timeless music of the rock era and check us out on Patreon where we curate even more uh, history and videos and, and full interviews. So it's time for another edition of our series, Bottle Lightning. This is where we break down a song that was king for a day, or for many days, but then the band wasn't able to parlay that into a long-term career of many hits. Today we have one of the best songs of its time. A hit that transcended many of the number one hits of the decade as a song that we still hear today. And it defines its year as well as any song from that year. Let's go back to 1983, as the British invaded American airwaves for a second time with the likes of Duran Duran and the police and Gary Newman and Joe Jackson, so many others were infiltrating the charts. You know, they were challenging the mellow soft rock of the time. And a band called Kajagugu, named after the sound of Baby Makes, started their ascent with a bass-infused synth-pop ditty called Too Shy. It had already hit number one in the UK in January of 83. Now, Kajagugu had started out as Art Nouveau, forming in uh, Leighton Buzzard, Bedfordshire in 1978. They were an avant-garde quintet with uh, Nick Beggs on bass and uh, Steve Askew on lead guitar, Stuart Croxford, Neil uh, was on keyboards and Jez Strode on drums. They released a single, The Fear Machine, which sold a couple hundred copies and they were on John Peel's show but they weren't able to lock down a record deal. Now in 1981, they advertised in a local paper for a new lead singer. Enter Christopher Hamill. Stage name, Lamal, uh, which is actually an anagram of his surname. From there, they changed their name to Kajagugu. They signed with EMI Records in mid-1982, and this was after Lamal met Duran Duran keyboardist Nick Rhodes. This is while he was working as a waiter at London's Embassy Club. Uh, this would prove to be a fateful meeting, as Nick Rhodes would end up co-producing Too Shy. And this was actually the band's debut single. Actually, Rhodes and longtime Duran Duran producer Colin Thurston both worked on Too Shy, to be exact. The single went to number one on the UK singles chart, like I said, which surprisingly accomplished this feat before any of Duran Duran's singles. Uh, Hungry Like the Wolf went to number five and Save a Prayer went to number two. So they actually beat Duran Duran to the punch. And I'm hungry like the wolf. Save it till the morning after. No. They wouldn't wait much longer, a few months uh, is there something I should know hit the top spot uh, that happened early summer? Too Shy was a smash worldwide, though. Scaling the charts in European countries and Japan. Spent five weeks in number one in Germany. It also reached the top of the summit in Belgium and Ireland, as well as reaching number two in France and Switzerland, and uh, also number four in Sweden, Austria, and the Netherlands. And the U.S., they carried the song up the charts on the strength of the memorable music video, you know, in the infancy of MTV. So classic 80s. And that bass line is so killer. It was played in heavy rotation on the network, and uh, that success played for a top five placing in the Billboard Hot 100. Now, as usually happens, as the band ascended to the top of the charts, the band started to have 
internal struggles. These struggles came to a head when the feather-haired singer Lamal was fired by the other band members in uh, mid-1983 after all that success. And then band member Nick Beggs, he took over lead singer duties. Now, in response to his firing, Lamal accused the others of just being jealous of him. And he said, I've been betrayed and I was sacked for making them a success. Those were his exact words then. The band had other feelings about it. They said that Lamal had become egomaniacal, almost impossible to work with. Soon after letting Lamal go, new singer Beg said, it was a business decision and not one that we took lightly. He wanted the band to go in a different direction to the rest of us. Eventually, we realized we were on a different planet to Lamal. From there, Lamal went after a solo career and Kajagugu continued. Uh, for Kajagugu, the first single by the new four-piece lineup with uh, Nick Beggs' as singer was Big Apple. It reached the top 10 in the UK, but it didn't chart in America. In fact, no other singles had any success in the US and the band actually retooled their name. They shortened it to just Kaja, which really didn't change anything. Uh, Too Shy remains the band's only top 40 hit to this point. Now for Lamal, it was a different story as he would hook up with Giorgio Moroder and return to the charts pretty quickly with the soundtrack song, The Never Ending Story. That hit number four in the UK, number 17 here. And of course, has found new life on Stranger Things a few years back. This is a scene that every 80s kid adored. I have to admit, I teared up a little bit watching this scene. It took me back to 1984. In fact, you know what? I'm gonna put this in the video about Lamal talking about Never Ending Story. We showed a little bit of this in a Stranger Things segment that we did about six months ago, but I'll put the whole thing in here along with Too Shy. Here's a story of Too Shy coming up. As we go into this interview, I wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Right now, you can get hundreds of pairs of glasses starting at just $6.95. Go get yourself a new pair of glasses or sunglasses right now. You can design them just like mine. You can put whatever you want on the side. I put Professor Rock on the side here. You can also add amazing features like blue blocks to protect your eyes from digital blue light. You choose your style. You can even do a virtual 3D try-on to see how you look before you buy. Make sure to click on the link below or download Zenny's new app. Here's Lamal with the story. I just remember that I was the kid at the back of the class in school with the radio, the discreet radio, not doing my studies. I don't recommend this to other kids, <laughs> okay? You know, we had these really terrible cheap radios and it was a mono, so you got one headphone in one ear. You know, technology, eh? I mean, we're going back to the 60s. I was born in 58. So there weren't all the radio channels that you've got now. So in the UK, there was this famous radio station that had been forced off the air. And so the guy chartered a boat out in the ocean. And this was, it was called Radio Caroline. And, um, the signal was terrible. So you'd be listening along, and this was something to do with, you know, whether there was a storm out on the ship or, or the way the wind was blowing. So you'd be listening to like, your favorite song, and then suddenly it would get all crackly and it would fade away, and you'd be really upset, especially if you're like trying to record it illegally. So yeah, I was just so passionate about music. I don't really know where that came from. What was the music that caught your ear? Well, I, I've talked about this many times. It was Motown. You could hear anything on a, on a radio station. Yeah. I just liked songs, really. And then I, I graduated as Motown took over the world. And there was a key event that happened in my life. I, I won a singing contest at this Northern Soul venue. Now, Northern Soul, do you know about that genre? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we'd get people like Gloria Jones appearing at the Wigan Casino doing the original version of Tainted Love, which later became a huge hit for Soft Cell. In fact, that's where Mark Allman heard the song, in the Northern Soul Clubs in Leeds, where he was from. Sometimes I feel I've got to run away. I've got to get away. Oh, baby, baby, where did our love go? And anyway, they had this singing contest and I won. 
and I won 10 albums of my own choice. Of the 10 albums that I won, um, five of them were Motown. And half of me love the music and half of me love the artwork on the albums because they were phenomenal. Anybody watching this, go online and look at the original artwork for Motown's greatest hits, three, four, five, six, seven, I think I had. And uh, they were amazing. Even the label was just beautiful. Of course. And on this tour that I'm on now, on the last stop is Detroit. And I'm gonna, I delayed my flight so I could go to the Motown the Museum. Film. I'm very excited about oh, that. Oh, that's awesome. Too Shy was, was such a massive hit. I mean, it still is. It's number one in the UK and Germany, number two in Switzerland, and then of course, number five in America. And if you think about new wave music in 82, 83, it was still making its entrance into our lexicon, into the, the minds of people. Mm. And to be a top five hit, that was huge. Mm. I mean, only a few people have done that. Human League, of course, did it with Don't You Want Me. But that was such a massive synthesizer-driven song. And there's a song, of course, about you giving advice to a girl. Tell me about how that song came together, what you remember about arranging it and writing it and recording it. Uh, well, the song started with the intro. And we were, we all had such different influences. You know, Jez, the drummer, was into Devo. Whip it! Whip it good! And Nick was into Frank Zappa. Yeah. I was into Manhattan Transfer. You know, I love it. It was a crazy mixture of influences. And you know, with songwriting, you really stumble on stuff. Any musician out there knows that. You just play around and you try stuff, you edit it, you try it that way, try it this way. You can spend hours doing that. And you have to do it. I imagine even more today because you have a century of lyrics and melodies. I mean, I what is there left to write? But um, we had this fantastic jazz chord at the beginning and then Nick started playing that bass. And we're all going, oh yeah, that sounds great. And then it got to the verse and it just, it fell on its ass to put it, <laughs> you know, bluntly. <laughs> it just went flat and we were like, oh no, no, that's not working. And so then, and I, I remember I said to uh, Stuart, we need to keep those chords going. That pad thing, it was so warm and, yeah. you know, made you feel good. And so it kind of evolved. Um, I think the last section that was done was the middle. And I think that was Nick. Yeah. We added on the doo-doos because it's very hard to find anything else to put there. It makes me smile when I remember that the bridge, the four bar section before the chorus, where it's the six words, hey girl, move a little closer. Okay. Hey girl, move a little closer. Originally that section had 35 words. Wow. And I've still got the tape <laughs> that shows that. A recording from the living room when we were and I'd, I forgot that I had it. I had a bag of cassettes in my loft. And uh, when I found that, I was like, oh my God, listen to it, you know. <laughs> so, um, no, it's wow. wonderful to sit here 35 years later and, uh, and talk about this song that clearly means a lot to people. It's part of the soundtracks of their lives, their first dance, their first lover, their first kiss behind the school sheds or what. I don't know, you know, so. And also the way that it reintroduces itself to the newer generations through movies and music and mm -hmm. video games. I mean, Grand Theft Auto and Sims 2, and of course, in the Adam Sandler movie, The Wedding Singer. Let's go say hello. And it's been used in Gilmore Girls and Ghost Rider. And it's just such a part of that 80s culture. And the 80s are as big now as they've ever been. Thank you. My kids love Too Shy. And they love the video too. And I've shown them live versions when yeah. you're seeing it. Because when you say, you do the little bit closer, then you do the, 
too shy eye to eye, you know yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, it's just so catchy. It's almost like, that part's almost like a nursery rhyme. Like kids can sing it and it's just, just tattoos its way on your soul. But the, the weird thing, if you think about it, if you took the synthesizer from the bridge, which has got that very distinctive bong, 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 it's fairly classic instrument. So drums, bass, guitar, and a string pad. The bass line's unusual. There's a synth riff in the chorus, but that could easily be a piano. And there's a few, you know, there's a few production toys, but um, I think that's why it works live. Whereas if we get to talk about Never Ending Story, yeah. that bleh, 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 yeah. sequencer, You know, that has to come off off track because no one can play that live. Oh, I know. But that's George and Murad. I'm going to blame that on him in a good way, of course. If we never had Donna Summer, I Feel Love, synthesizer, sequencer, toys for the boys, playing around with, you know, we wouldn't have that great record. Well, on the video too, the emergence on MTV, it was like it came at the perfect time when MTV was being watched in full color. You are seeing music videos and... And that video is such a classic video. And now it's found new life on YouTube where people are watching like crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you remember about the video? I remember that it cost 35,000 pounds, which was a lot of money yeah. back then. Now you could probably make the same video for 5,000, yeah. you know, because technology has evolved. I remember that Ali Espley, the yeah. model, who married, Dennis, married Miller. Dennis Miller, was a friend of mine. Friend of the band, actually. And I was with her the night she met Dennis, but that's another story. So, yeah, they, they talked about um, the era's change. It's very subtle. I don't think a lot of people even realize that in the video. It's supposed to go from 40s to 50s or 60s to the 70s, something like that. Uh, it was fun. It was a long day. There was a lot of production people on that. And I said to the director, oh, I know the perfect girl for the video. She's a friend of mine. And uh, he met Ali, and wow. now she's immortalized as this, what was she then, 25 or I something. Know. And she was modeling in London. The one last thing I want to ask you about Too Shy, the chorus is the thing that always stands out. How did that chorus come about? Did you just like start singing it, or how did you craft that? Shy, shy, how shy, shy do I? It could have been Nick. I don't really remember. We with just thrashing ideas around. Um, and that phrase stuck. Because the way you sing it too, that just that lives yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, I think I have a pop voice. You know, there's no bones about it. You know, I don't have a rock voice. I've there's got this Broadway kind of- way in it. I've, yeah, it's kind yeah. of smooth, you yeah. know, it has its tone. It works on that song. And I'm grateful for that. Well, Never Ending Story, Keith Forsey, who of course wrote Don't You Forget About Me and worked with Billy Idol. Didn't, and he, didn't he produce Eyes Without a Face? He did. Billy Idol, yeah. yeah. Eyes a face, God no and then Giorgio, of course. Yes. Master. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that came together. <laughs> in a recent interview, this is in the last five years, Giorgio was asked about this. Why did he ask me to sing the song? And he said, and his lovely German-Italian accent. He is Italian, but yeah. he did all the, you know, he did all the recordings in yeah. Munich because it was, he lived close to the border. But uh, he, I was, uh, I liked this song, you know, this uh, shy, shy. And he sings it out of tune, which made me laugh in the interview. Um, I, I like this guy's voice, you know, so I thought, mm, let's try that guy. Oh, a key thing was, um, EMI Records asked me to go to Tokyo and perform at this massive event at the Budokan Hall, which is a beautiful hall, 10,000 it holds. This event's called the Tokyo Music Festival. It's a sort of Eurovision, but for another part of the world with a 10 million viewing audience. And my manager at the time said, well, you have to go. It's great promotion and blah, blah, blah. And you've got a new single coming out. A band had broke up at this point. So I went with my first solo single, Only For Love. Because there's a sort of judging panel. It's very celebrity driven. I mean, the people they'd had at this festival were phenomenal. You know, we're talking Dinah Ross, 
The year that I was there, they had uh, Laura Brannigan, mm -hmm. who just had that massive hit with Gloria. Gloria. And a couple of other people. Anyway, Giorgio was on the panel and my manager was a great networker. He could charm you all evening with stories about his work with Rod Stewart. Billy Gaff was his name. Billy was quite the personality, the entrepreneur, very successful. And uh, I, I think that he, he went out for dinner with Giorgio. I know that that happened. And he probably told Giorgio that I was going to be the best thing since sliced bread. And uh, then when I got back to the UK, we got the call to, did I want to go to Munich to try my voice on the recording? I was like, what do you mean try? I've just had a number one hit around the world that I wrote. What does he mean try? But anyway, of course I knew who Georgia was. I was very excited. And um, I stayed up all night partying, drinking, smoking, had about four hours sleep, flew to Munich, nearly missed the flight. Um, couldn't sing the song in the afternoon because I was tired. And it's quite high for me, top of my range. In fact, I really wish Georgia had, had written that song a semitone lower. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I have to work so hard to sing it live. But in the evening, it was fine. Uh, we had some wine. And Georgia was very calming. You know, hey, and he used to call me Lim. Hey, Lim, don't worry. We, you know, we, th we try, uh, we have some food, you know, and some wine. And, this, <laughs> and uh, everything will be fine. And, that, and it was. And then... The next day, um, I got the call that he liked it. And the weird thing is, um, I never met Beth Anderson, the, the female yeah. singer, until years later. Well, and then they had the great cover of it, Shooter Jennings and Brandy Carlisle. That's a movie from my childhood that here in America was huge. It's mm -hmm. become a cult hit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it did well at the box office, but even more so. Well, I, obviously I knew that it was the best-selling children's book of all time in Germany. It seemed to make sense to make it into a film. And it was aimed at a young market. We were teeny idols. We were massive teeny idols in Germany. There was this pop magazine, weekly pop magazine called Bravo. And we were on the front cover every week. <laughs> and so, you know, I think the corporate said, they put two and two together and said, you know, and Giorgio and blah, blah, blah. So all... Oh, it serendipity or fate or whatever you want to call it. It just all worked out. And of course, it was great for me because I was fired by the band in a phone call. At the time, I was young. And of course, I was quite hurt by all that. And so to get um, this worldwide number one hit with this amazing legendary producer was sort of sweet revenge, really. And they didn't have another hit, really. Well, I thought they wrote some great stuff. But, you know, once you put that question mark in the audience's minds, in the media's minds uh, about, well, you have to reprove yourself. And, uh, and then half the fan base went with them and half went with me. And then the record company personnel changed and they're sort of who was guiding us anymore, you know. So, yeah, it's a whole, obviously a whole huge mistake. Well, there, there was a rumor that you were in the movie. I remember as a kid that was passed around at my school that Lamal's in the movie. Who is he? Which, which character is he? I was in the video that yeah, included yeah. clips of the movie. I think that's where the rumor started. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. But you had such an iconic look that definitely influenced a lot of what we have now. Yeah. I'm happy about that. Isn't that that's great? a good thing. The thing about Lamal is that the guy doesn't age. He still looks like he's in his early 30s. Make sure to leave us a comment about this bottle lightning classic, Too Shy, about the never ending story as well. What do you remember about this song? What do you remember about Kaja Gugu and Lamal? Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. Uh, we'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>